I was raised going to a Lutheran church in the suburbs of Chicago. Not knowing anything else, that church became what I thought about when I thought about church. The way they gathered, what they did. I was baptized there. I was confirmed there. Uh, I don't talk about this church often because looking back on what happened on Sunday, the hymns we sang, I, the, the prayers we prayed, I never saw how that changed how people lived on Tuesday. Right? What happened on Sunday didn't seem to impact what people did on Friday. And so there's no really good reason, it seemed, for me to remember, because it wasn't anything that seemed to really make a difference. Now, admittedly, there were some reasons that I didn't see the church making a difference in people's lives. Uh, one of them was geographic. I lived in Shorewood. I went to school in Manuka, and then I went to church over here in Joliet. And so all that youth, the youth group in the church, they went to a completely different school. And, and all the adults that, that I saw, I only saw them on Sunday. And so the, the adults I saw, they weren't my teachers. They weren't the cops I saw. They weren't the, the business owners. They weren't the people that I was around. And so I never saw them other than on Sunday morning when we all sat still, looked forward, and, and saw each, the back of each other's heads. I mean, that just that's not enough to form a community. And so... The long and short of it is, I grew up at a church where Jesus did not seem to make a difference. There was no challenge, purpose, mission, and so I didn't see why I should bother. Following Jesus seemed optional, comfortable, easy, and if it's so easy, why would I want to waste my time doing it? Since then, I have obviously learned and studied. I have met people for whom following Jesus is the most important thing in their lives, and I have decided to follow Jesus myself, and uh, obviously I've changed my mind on some things. But from where I stand now, what I can look back and I can see things differently. What I can see is that the church in which I was raised, it was not a bad church. It was not the exception. It was not some sort of oddball. The church I was part of growing up was part of a trend that goes back 200 years. The, church, the, the norm for churches in America, and, and that norm for 200 years was that to be Christian in America was to be comfortable. Specifically, to be Protestant Christian in America was to be comfortable and easy. And, and that's for a very obvious reason. America was a nation founded by a whole bunch of Christians. Right? America was founded by a whole bunch of Christians, Protestant, European Christians, and that has been the truth of this nation for, well, 200 years. And, and, and please notice that there's a difference between saying a nation of Christians and a Christian nation. A nation of Christians with a nation with a whole lot of Christians in it. A Christian nation would be a nation with, a, with Jesus Christ and its founding documents. For us to be a Christian nation, you'd need to have Jesus and the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution. He's not there. I've checked. So we're not a Christian nation, but we started out as a, Christian of, a nation of Christians. And for the most part, that nuance didn't matter for a long, long time. We're a nation of Christians, and, and it didn't matter uh, whether if we weren't officially a Christian nation, because that's what everyone was. And so to be Christian was normal. To be Christian, that's our business leaders, politicians, lawyers, doctors, mechanics, teachers. Those were our, just other people that we saw at church, fellow Christians. To be Christian and to be American seemed to be pretty much the same thing. And that began to change, didn't it? It began to change. It was gradual at first, but it began to change. Anyone want to take a stab at when that change began? When did everything start to change in the country? 60s, right? Everything started to change in the 60s. After 200 years uh, of this nation, that's when things began to change. That is when we went from Camelot to Watergate, right? That's when we, went, we looked in the mirror and realized, well, we still do have some racial issues, don't we? That was the high water mark for the American worker. Ever since the, 19, the early 1970s, the real wages of Americans have dropped it had not kept up with inflation. That was the point at which this nation's culture began to have significant changes. After 200 years of being a monoculture of American Protestantism and Christianity being the, this, what was accepted, after 200 years of Enlightenment-based culture, a time that we call modernity, in the 60s, that began to change. And we now live in a time that we... 
well, you could call it post what is often called as post-modernity, which is interesting because we're not even sure what to call it other than it's post what was. It's after modernity. We're not quite sure what it's like yet, but it, it's not what it was. And, and that seems to be the truth, right? The assumptions that used to be safe to make, well, can you make them anymore? It used to be safe to assume that everyone needs to go to church, everyone know, knows why they need to go to church, and if they're not at church, they're going to get to church when you invite them to church, because everyone goes to church, right? That was once the truth. That was once the safe assumption. Is that true anymore? No. It was once true, it, seemed, it was once a safe assumption that you, what America does, what, what we believe as Christians, that's going to line up, right? That seemed to be a, a safe assumption to, to make. Getting practical, it was once safe to assume that no one would ever schedule anything on a church night. And everyone knew what a church night was, and no one would ever touch a church night. How's that holding up, right? <laughs> we could talk about this change at great length. We could look at it in a whole bunch of different ways. We could look at it as the 1960s being the end of a 200-year period in American history that began with the Great Awakenings, the First and Second Great Awakenings that set the nation on the course religiously that it, had, that it was on until the 1960s. You could back up a little bit further. You could say that the 1960s was the end of modernity, the time that began after the, the religious wars of the Reformation. Information. And, and after that, that was the 16th century. In the 17th century, there was the rise of the Enlightenment and science and modernity. And, and that the 1960s is the end of that 400-year period of time. You could, you could go all the way back to the first century and you could say that, that is the, this is the end of Christendom. That it ended in the 1960s. It began back in the first century when the Emperor Constantine and his son Constinian made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire empire. And since then, in Western uh, civilization, whether it's official or not, Christianity was the religion of Western Europe and Western culture until we hit the 60s, and that no longer became a safe assumption. You can narrate this in a whole bunch of different ways. Believe what you want about it, but I do think, I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. Everything started changing in the 60s. Is that right? Okay. The church I grew up in was trying its darndest to hold on to the time before the 1960s. And I don't blame them. I really don't. I, I do not blame them because that before the, the 1960s was a time when church was thriving. Everything seemed to be so much easier and, and it was just easy to hold on to that and it was hard to change and look towards a time such as today. You know what the fastest growing religious group in America is right now? None. And I'm not talking Catholic nuns. N-O-N-E. None. What's your religious affiliation? I don't have one. That's the fastest growing religious affiliation right now. Closely followed by spiritual but not religious. We live in a different time. A time when culture has fractured, opinions are becoming extreme, and a common point of view has faded. Harry Truman once said, back when he was working for the Navy, you're entitled to your own opinion but not to your own facts. That doesn't seem to hold, does it? Everyone seems to have their own facts nowadays. And what we have is people saying crazy things like, that's right for you, but it's not right for me. And, you know, and that's, fine. that's fine to say when you're talking about how you want your steak cooked. I like my steak cooked medium rare. My wife gags at it. That, that's okay. Uh, but when you say that's right for you, but that's not right for me, when it comes to matters of faith, that gets a bit dicey, doesn't it? When I say that Jesus Christ is Lord, that the only way to know God fully is to see the Son who reveals that there is a Father through the power of the Holy Spirit. When I say that the God that is the true God, the creator of all things, is a God who having raised Israel out of Egypt, then raised Jesus from the dead. Those are the most important words I think I've ever said in my life. That is my faith. Right? That's what I base my life on. And for someone to say, you know, that might be right for you, but that's not right for me. Did you hear what I said? <laughs> you know, we, but that's what has happened, is religion has become one among many tastes. I like Dannon instead of Yoplait. I like medium rare instead of well done. And I like atheist over Christian. I mean, that, that's the culture we're in right now. You decide whatever, you, whatever your taste is, and that is just fine. We have left behind a time when to be Christian is automatically respected 
And we are heading into a time when to be a committed Christian is seen as something a bit odd, if not downright strange. Why am I talking about all of this? Andy, buzzkill Andy strikes again. No, it's because this is the situation into which Paul writes his letter at Thessalonica. Right? If you look back to Thessalonica in the first century, what I've just described is what they were living then. What they were living then, this church to which Paul writes, they're living in a time period of the Roman Empire when the dominant religion is whatever. Right? They were, it was, it's called polytheism. And so you can believe whatever God you want, whatever pantheon of gods you want. You can have an Egyptian pantheon of gods and worship Horus or Osiris, or maybe a Greek pantheon, uh, of, including Aphrodite and Zeus, maybe a Roman pantheon, Venus and Jupiter and all of them. Every god had their feast. Throw in a feast for the Roman emperor while you're at it, because why not? He's the Caesar. He's in charge. Believe what you want. Let other people believe what they want. Everyone shows up at each other's feast for each other's gods. And in the middle of this group of, that's right for me, whatever's right for you, in the middle of this, this, this time period, there was this group of people who were kind of crazy. Because they were saying things like, Jesus is God, and there are no other gods. That's what they were saying in Thessalonica. And you know what was happening? Their neighbors were giving them flack. Wait a minute, you used to be normal. You used to come out to all the parties. You used to come out to all the religious feasts with us. And you don't come out with us anymore. What happened? What changed in you? Why are you so weird? They stopped, the, these Christians, they stopped worshiping the emperor. They stopped going to the Roman games. And this is, causes them great social problems. One of the biggest challenges to the spread of the faith in Jesus Christ in the first century was people's neighbors who gave them flack about why did he turn so weird? For them to be committed to one God when obviously everyone should just be able to believe what they want caused them problems. This is the type of social pressure that I see building today, right? I, we're talking about social pressure. I'm not talking about suffering, right? I don't want to overblow this. If you want to talk about suffering, Christians, go to Iraq. Go to Egypt. There's an entire tradition of Egyptian Christians, they're called Coptic Christians, that is, is just on the brink of extinction. They are dying for their faith. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about social uh, just pressure, that, that things aren't how they used to be, and to be Christian is not the assumed norm, and it automatically made accommodations for. And I think the easiest place to see this is, guess where? The school schedule, right? How often do we have practices scheduled on Wednesdays now? How often do you see tournaments on Sundays? How often, I, mean, I see, there's a grandmother I know who has to choose on a regular basis between going to church and going and seeing her grandson play in a traveling uh, be baseball uh, league. I mean, this is the decisions we're having to make. I see, uh, I was talking to a pastor this week who ran a, va a vacation Bible school in Marceline. And this guy, this pastor is amazing. Guy's named Brian. He is an amazing pastor. He runs a great program with youth. I wish I could be half the pastor he is. And, and you know what happened to his VBS this year? It came up against summer school. Summer school's paying a hundred bucks per kid. If you don't miss any days, you know what happened? VBS got shot, right? Now, would that have happened a couple decades ago, or would the, the school and, and, and the church have worked that out? Right? But things have changed. Things have changed. You know, I hear of tournaments. Uh, there was a, a basketball tournament that a local school, not my own, but a local school, played it on December 26th last year. Can't celebrate Christmas with your family if you've got to go hustle the kid over to a ball tournament. And I'll tell you one of the most impressive moments of faith I've seen in years. I was at church camp three years ago, and Ricky, I almost call him a kid. He's probably, he's like a junior in college now. This man came up to me, and he told me, Andy, I am here, even though it's the second week of my ball camp for school. And if I go back, when I go back, I may or may not have a, I might be benched. He, he may or may not have a position when he got back, but he still wanted to come to church camp because that's where he finds Jesus. And I thought, hallelujah, this is a statement of faith. This is a commitment to Jesus that is just amazing. But that's, that's the type of thing I'm seeing today. Following Jesus is no longer comfortable, easy, the norm. It's just going to cost us something. To follow Jesus, it's going to have cultural consequences. Right? 
Paul has been told this is happening in Thessalonica, and he writes to encourage them. And paying attention to what he writes, I think, is important because it encourages us as well. He writes to them that, you know, I, Paul, caught flack too when I was in Philippi, and you know what happened to me in Thessalonica. I got run out of town. And he requests, he, he responds, he says, you know what, I had courage in that moment. I continued to preach Jesus Christ and the good news of the gospel, implying that you too can, can do the same. And he does this even when misunderstood. Right? If not everyone knows who Jesus is and you stand up to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, someone's going to misunderstand you. And that's what was happening to Paul. Paul points out that not only is there some individual problems happening here, but that the entire church is catching some flack, just like the church at Jerusalem suffered. And this is where I want to point out that comma, because this one sentence gets warped in a horrible way. What, what Paul writes is that you're going to catch flack because you're imitating the church just of, of, in Judea. And the church of Judea caught flack from the Jews who murdered Jesus and his prophets. Now, there's, is there a comma in that sentence? This becomes an important question because a comma makes a difference. What's the difference between let's eat grandpa and let's eat grandpa? Right? There's, a, there's a little bit of a difference there. Commas matter. Uh, except, I gotta tell you, in Greek there are no commas. The comma hasn't been invented. I don't know when the comma is invented, but in first century Greek writing, the comma doesn't exist. All the letters just run right into each other. And so, there, there's a comma that is inserted in there. Every comma in the New Testament is an insertion. It doesn't really exist. But this comma has caused a lot of problems, because if you put a comma in there, what it says is, you're catching flack, just like the church at Judea caught flack from the Jews, comma, who killed Jesus and his disciples. But that comma doesn't exist. If you take the comma out, what does it say? Catching flack from the Jews who killed Jesus and his prophets. And, and there's a difference there, isn't there? It's not all of the Jews who killed Jesus. It's the Jews who killed Jesus. And, and that, has be, that one sentence has caused more anti-Semitism than there, I'm not sure if there are any, many other, maybe at the end of Matthew, there are, this is one of the key anti-Semitic texts of the Bible, and it all revolves around whether a comma is there, and I've got to tell you, it's not. So let's just, no comma, God is angry at the Jews who killed Jesus, I don't blame them. Moving on. Paul continues, points out that he keeps on working, taking part in the life of the city, being a tent maker under persecution and social pressure. He doesn't withdraw into a, a sort of Christian bubble and only talk to Christian and, and Christianese and only go to church. He stays out in the community meeting other people and, and that they continue to do this as well. And, and so this in, ends up being the question for us today. How are they able to continue to follow Jesus not because following Jesus is easy or comfortable, not because it's acceptable, but following Jesus, why? What do you have a passion for? Let's get at it this way. What do you have a passion for? That's a non-rhetorical question. What do you, are you passionate about? Everyone's blah. We are not passionate about anything. Anyone passionate about golf? I'm sorry, that was too easy. Uh, what, what are y'all passionate about? Reading. Reading. Anyone passionate about food? Cooking, right? I sit down and, and I will get, if I'm making a dish, I'll, I'll look up and realize I've spent an hour chopping and dicing and slicing to get ready for a dish. And for some people, the idea of standing in front of a cooking, uh, a, 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 with a knife and so in front of vegetables and chopping for an hour, that sounds like drudgery, Right? For me, that, yeah, for me, that's great. I mean, I would, when I'm having a bad day, I go home and I make some, myself something fabulous. I'll make myself like a red curry, tilapia, lemongrass over ja, ja, uh, jasmine rice with a, oh, it's just great. That, I have a passion for food. You may have guessed this. How do you know what you're passionate about? It's what you're willing to suffer for. The word passion comes from the Latin verb for to suffer. You are passionate about what you're willing to suffer for. I am passionate about food. I'm willing to suffer to make great food. I am passionate for my family. I am passionate for this church. I am passionate in following Jesus Christ. 
I am willing to suffer for these things. I'm not passionate about my lawn. You may have noticed my lawn usually looks pretty bad. I'm sorry. I don't care. I truly don't. I mow it as often as I must. I, I just don't have a passion for it. And I'm, so I'm not willing to suffer for it. This is what we see uh, in, in, in this first century church. You are passionate for what you're willing to suffer for because it brings you joy. Right? You are willing to suffer for these things because it brings you a joy, a satisfaction, and that's what we hear Paul writing to the church at Thessalonica. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for in spite of the persecution, you received the word with joy. Right? They have joy from following Jesus Christ. And they have a passion for following Jesus Christ. And they're willing to suffer for following Jesus Christ because it brings them joy, even in the midst of this social pressure. My friends, as we leave behind the times when being Christian is the norm, and we travel into whatever it is that's next, when we go into this time when being a committed Christian is seen as increasingly strange and weird, we travel into a time when there are going to be some societal and, and social costs for following Jesus, whether it is telling children and grandchildren that Jesus trumps sports, or we have to learn to more fully practice tithing and sacrificial giving, or we have to stand up for our faith knowing that we are likely to be misunderstood, and no one likes to be misunderstood. In these times, I believe it is important to listen to Paul and learn the lessons of the church at Thessalonica, that, that we can do these things, not because they are comfortable, but because in doing them we are following our passion for Jesus Christ, that we are finding the joy of the Spirit that moves in us, for in following Jesus, we find the peace and the Spirit of God. We find purpose in this life and salvation and in the life to come. My friends, furthermore, I have to tell you that I have hope. I'm not looking forward. I, I would not be serving a church if I thought over the next like couple decades I'm just going to get whooped up all the time. right? I don't serve the church because I'm a sadomasochist and I just enjoy pain and suffering. I serve the church because I have great hope for what comes next. Because you look at the early church. When, did the, when has the church thrived and grown most? It wasn't when it was the official state religion of Rome. It's in those first decades when it did catch some flack, but when it was a committed group of Christians following Jesus as, and they were an oasis of the peace of God in the midst of a pagan culture that did not know how broken it was. And we too are called in the same way. We are called to be an oasis of the sacred, an oasis of the peace of God, an oasis of God's kingdom, of good news in the midst of a secular society that, that does not realize how far it has fallen. And it has. Watch a music video. Ugh, right? More people experience the good news of Jesus when they see what that news does. And we are heading into a time when we will have opportunities to bring people to Jesus Christ for the first time. There are opportunities ahead of us. A little bit of social pressure, a little bit of challenge, but the opportunities to bring people to the joy and salvation of Jesus Christ are even the greater. Thanks be to God. Amen.